Thanks very much to the Arts Council and um, Nesta for inviting me to speak today. What I'm going to do is um, talk a little bit about blast theory and a little bit about our background. I mean, I'm sure some of you in this room are familiar with what we do, but obviously, um, you know, some of you aren't. So I thought I'd just give a bit of context for who we are and then go into um, this case study of this recent project, or this project that was commissioned last year by Channel 4 Education called Ivy Forever, which is um, an SMS drama, the first ever SMS drama um, commissioned by, um, by Channel 4. So uh, Blast Theory is a group of artists um, who, are, who are now based in Brighton. The company formed in 1991 in London, so it's our 20th birthday this year, and I, the company really formed n not to make works that, into, that use technology, but to make works that, uh, I guess, engaged with audiences in really interesting ways and engaged with audiences outside of tr traditional sort of gallery and museum and theatre venues. So the company has always been driven by an interest in the audience and how to create sort of really responsive, interactive, participatory experiences for audiences. And even though we work very much um, with technology to create that experience now, that is still the sort of fundamental driver of, of the company. Um, so in 2006, we relocated to Portslade. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you would know um, Portslade. It's, uh, it's sort of on the edge of Brighton and Hove. We have this building here, which we've converted into studios and a, and a permanent base for the company. You actually can't see our part of the building. This is on a sort of edge of an escarpment here and where it goes down two floors and we're on the very ground floor in the Travis Perkins Woodyard, which some of you <laughs> might know on the sort of Shoreham Harbour. Um, and so I, I guess something that fundamentally changed the company and really gave it the technology digital profile was a collaboration with the Mixed Reality Lab that started in 1997. And the Mixed Reality Lab is at the University of Nottingham and is, is a world leader really in, I guess, developing and thinking about and researching mixed reality um, te mixed reality applications and augmented reality applications, which is really as the combination of the real and the virtual world, which sort of Anthony uh, had a question about earlier, which, you know, is something that, that we continue to explore as a company. Um, the company became a regularly funded organisation of uh, the Arts Council in 2003, and we're very pleased to be going into the national um, portfolio in 2012. Um, so, we're very, as I said before, we're very interested in this sort of relationship with an audience outside of traditional spaces. So a lot of our work happens on the streets, it's site specific, it's, it's urban, and uh, this work is one of the first work, well I guess is one of the first works that really used game, well Desert Rain was another work, an earlier work, but can you see me now, really used gaming technology and uh, create a, re a relationship between online players and players on the streets. So this is one of our players on the streets of the city who's having an interaction and being guided by a, a player on the internet. So it's almost a bit like a hide-and-seek game, but played um, online and on the streets of the city. Uh, it really brought a lot of attention to the company. We received sort of several BAFTA nominations and um, awards for Can You See Me Now and, and our other work. But more recently, we're, we're sort of focusing on, um, I guess, mobile technologies, handheld devices, and using, uh, using Wi-Fi, using GPS and, and SMS. Um, SMS is, is really of interest to us because um, it's a way to reach audiences at, in a very sort of low, in the lowest common denominator, I guess. It's everyone has a phone, pretty much. Um, uh, everyone knows how to text. It's it's a it's a really sort of nimble way to reach audiences, and it's a very responsive way to reach audiences. So this was the first work that we created that used SMS Day of the Figurines. It was a game that ran for 24 days, and the audience um, signed in at this sort of gaming table. They took on an identity of a figurine, then played this game for 24 days, and basically it's just a series of text messages going going back and forth. But for us, it's really, 
we're really interested in how you can create stories and immersive narratives through a really sort of basic textual, um, textual mode, the textual mode of, of SMS. Um, so just a couple of other recent works. This is Rider Spoke, which is a work, um, some of you might have, it was in the Brighton Festival in 2008. I don't know, has anyone, is anyone familiar with this work? Yeah, a couple of people. So you take a cycle ride around the city with a small um, uh, Nokia N800 internet tablet. You listen to a series of questions and audio recordings and you respond to those. You record your answers to those questions. And then you leave those responses in sort of Wi-Fi hotspots around the city. And as you cycle around the city, you can, um, you can listen to previously recorded responses from others. So it really creates this sort of layered, intimate sort of storytelling um, of the city. And um, we presented that in Sydney, which is, um, you know, the iconic Sydney Opera House in the background. And... Um, it's been a really successful work for us and continues to tour. I mean, we are a touring company. We show our works sort of across the UK and internationally. And one of our most recent works is A Machine to See With, which was a commission from three commissioners in North America, BAPF, New Media Centre, Sundance Film Festival and Zero One Festival. And it, the commission is a piece of locative cinema where we were sort of challenged to imagine what cinema could be outside of the cinema space. And... So we, um, the project we've developed is basically six people work together to rob a bank. And so it's a series of phone calls and the six people play at the same time and they have to sort of strategize and work together and exchange with each other to, to rob a bank. Um, and as you can see, we, are, we demand quite a lot of our audiences to sludge through the snow here in Sundance, but... We'll be presenting that work in, during the Brighton Digital Festival. And it's a new work that is, um, uh, is touring and sort of doing really well for us. And really, I think the idea is that the audience is, is in the film. You imagine yourself as an actor in this heist movie. So on to broadcasting. Um, so Blast Theory has had a particular interest in, um, in broadcasting and working with a broadcaster. And this has been an ambition over a few years. And we're really interested in, in broadcasting um, because it provides sort of access to new audiences, um, the creative and technical challenges, the business development, um, potential new revenue streams, and obviously new contacts and, and networks outside of, our, outside of sort of the art sector. Um, and we also sort of feel that, you know, broadcasters are now really, are really with, the, with convergence, with the convergence of sort of television and internet. Um, broadcasters are really looking for new ways to tell stories on those platforms. Um, the, the sort of age of linear narrative is, is sort of long gone now. And broadcasters are, are really sort of challenged by how to sort of reconstruct and reinvent the traditional TV model. So... Uh, we've actually been really fortunate to have received some money through a grant for the arts to uh, invest in us exploring how we might sort of develop broadcast projects as a sort of business model within, within the company. But also an element of that is um, how, we, how the company starts to generate more of, a, more of its own IP so that um, we can sort of exploit that IP um, in the marketplace and look at sort of potential commercial um, opportunities for the company. So, it's, it, you know, this is... Um, it, and I think, you know, this is why this is... What we're doing is relevant to, to, to the discussion we're having here today because we are really looking at issues of sort of business models, IP, broadcasting, and, um, and how we can develop new partnerships around that. So... Ivy Forever um, is a purely SMS project. Um, it's, it's a story that centres around this character, Ivy, uh, who leaves home and it's about... She's around 17 years old and it's about her challenges as, as, a, as a young woman um, leaving home. Um, we're really looking at at issues of sort of family, um, sex, sort of education, um, drugs. So it's got all, it's, so we've really tried to, I guess, 
look at how to create a, an engaging story around those issues just using SMS. Um, so Channel 4, through Channel 4 Education, sponsored us or they commissioned us to, um, to create one episode, a seven day episode of this SMS drama. Um, at the time, some of you might know Matt Locke. Matt Locke was uh, a commissioner at Channel 4 Education and it was really through Matt Locke champion, championing this project that, that we got it through Channel 4 Education. I mean, cha um, Matt, while he, whilst he was at Channel 4, was really interested in looking at new models of storytelling um, that, that Channel 4 could support. And he was really interested in, interested in supporting sort of experimental models of storytelling. So. This for, this for Channel 4, I guess, was an investment in an experiment. And it was an investment in, I guess, how you could use SMS and how you could use SMS um, in relationship to sort of education and, and bring in those sort of issues that are really relevant to teenagers through the, through the sort of platform of SMS. So the project is aimed at 14 to 7 year olds and we worked with um, a really fantastic writer, Tony White, who's the author of, of Foxy T. Um, so uh, how it works is um, the, or the audience go online, they register their mobile number and email address and, and then on a certain day, so the trial was set for October um, 2010. So on, I think it was about, October the 10th or the 7th, the trial started, and on that day, everyone who had registered and signed up received an SMS message to, to sort of start the game. And once they receive the, the sort of first series of SMS messages, they can start to text back to Ivy. So the idea is that it, it's very interactive and that all the story is told in the personal voice of Ivy. So Ivy is... I guess asking you to go on a journey with her, asking you to trust her and to, to really create a dialogue um, between the audience and Ivy. Um, and I mean, this was a real challenge for us, was how to, I guess, create a fictional character that, that was believable and that would engage an audience. But at the same time, um, the audience had to be aware that this wasn't a real person somehow. So, it w so there were many challenges for us in terms of sort of developing the story. And, and as over the seven days, it becomes more intimate. You know, I Ivy asks more of you. She, she asks advice from you. She tells her your secrets. So it's, it, it's, it's really the drama become, the drama is really that relationship between Ivy, Ivy and the, the sort of participant. And so this is just an example of, of one of the, 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 um, the conversations that went on. Um, uh, Ivy asks, you know, do you know someone who's missed their period? Um, and Caitlin, this was the, the participant, responds. And sort of they go on in this sort of quite intimate dialogue where, you know, Ivy is asking her help, she's responding, um, you know, and, and, it, and it ends, you know, I feel I can, I can talk to you about it, do you mind? No, not at all, I'm happy to help. And of course, these are all automated answers. Um, there's no one sitting at the other end of, of the phone sending a message back to the participant. It's all entirely automated. And this was an incredible challenge um, for us in terms of, in terms of the, the sort of technical development, which I'll we'll just talk about in a minute. How am I going for time, Angela? Hey, okay. <laughs> um, so I sort of feel I'm sort of crunching all of this into, into a short amount of time. So uh, just on sort of why, why we used SMS, um, you know, as I've said before, it's, it's, um, it's, it is a na native platform for teenagers. You know, teenagers are SMSing each other all the time. And we just felt it's, it, it, it's, it's a way we can get into teenagers' pockets. You know, they don't, they don't have to spend anything. They don't have to go anywhere. They don't have to... Well, they, they do have to commit, but <laughs> it's not as though that we're asking them to do anything outside of their, their normal lives. Um, and it, it's, free, it's free to sign up. Um, text messages are received at, at a standard rate, and so it's not costing, not costing the, the, the sort of young people that play anything more. Um, it's... it's 
it's persistent, it sort of mingles with the other text messages on your phone, so it sort of becomes a part of sort of your daily dialogue, and um, it's, it is sort of anonymous. Um, it's, we sort of really wanted the, the players to feel as though they could um, tell Ivy their, their secrets or tell, be, be sort of confidential with Ivy and, and that, that they, could tr they could trust her as well. Um, so to develop the story, we actually um, conducted quite a few focus groups with young people. Of, of course, finding the right text language was really difficult because, you know, some, one group of young people would go, oh, that's, you know, text language is really naff. Um, you know, we hate the way that people don't spell on text. You know, we, we really, you know, would prefer you to use, you know, proper spelling and good spelling. And then other people would say, oh, no, you know, text language is, you know, make things really short and snappy. So we're getting really conflicting sort of messages um, from our focus group. So we sort of tried to incorporate most of that, um, that feedback in, into, into the script itself. Um, and then, of course, Channel 4 were very involved in, in the process of signing off the scripts um, and, and, I guess, feeling confident that it was rich enough to sort of engage sort of that our target audience of 14 to 17-year-olds. Um, so a challenge for us was really to, I get, um, get reach the audience that we're after. I mean, Blast Theory doesn't work, or we don't really work with young people, it's not a sort of target audience, it's not an audience that we work with regularly. For, so for us to reach uh, a sort of broad demographic, um, we really wanted to, I guess, um, make this a national project, a project with national profile, and to reach an audience in an age range that, we, that, we, that isn't familiar to us at all was, was a real challenge. And we worked with um, a marketing company, Holler, who have done all the publicity for Skins. So obviously, Skins is huge. And I mean, they provided some really sort of essential advice to us on, on, on I guess, how we might reach teenagers and to go where those teenagers are. Um, uh, social media was really important. Um, we created an Ivy Facebook fan page and, and a Twitter identity, and Twitter actually became really important for us in terms of building, uh, not only promoting the work, but starting to build a dialogue with the people who were taking part in, in the trial. So, so Twitter was sort of quite unexpected for us because there was this not only while the, the trial was happening and people were, the, the audience was sort of participating um, in, in the drama, they were also tweeting about it. So, um, and I think one thing we, we really learned was that, um, because how we structured the episode was that once you registered, you had to start on the day. And we sort of realised that the word of mouth really started to build during the week, during the seven days. And that, if we'd left the registration open, we probably could have at least doubled our numbers, you know, through that sort of word of mouth. And because our target for the trial, which took, which took place in October, was 1,000 users, and we got to about 800. And so it, it was sort of disappointing for us to not reach that target, but at the same time, 800 users really I guess, provided the sort of feedback we were wanting in terms of how people were engaging with the script and the text and also te testing the technology. Um, and, I mean, obviously it was fantastic having Channel 4 um, on board with us and uh, we got a couple of nice little tweets like this one. You know, it's not only the future, it's the present. So, you know, but by this time it was sort of... I think they tweeted this the day or before registrations closed. So it was, you know, that was a real learning curve for us. So just on the technical development, we developed the, uh, the sort of SMS platform, the back engine, totally from scratch. Um, we worked with a, a local company here in Brighton, Talk Web Solutions, on the implementation of, of that platform. We worked very closely with them in terms of the design um, and the impl implementation because it not only had to sort of deliver the text messages, it 
we had to sort of build in various requirements from Channel 4, like mo moderation. Um, we had to build in um, privacy settings, data protection. Uh, but we also built in, I guess, mechanised sort of evaluation systems that we used at, at the end of the project. So it was really fantastic for us to work, I guess, in collaboration with this company, Talk Web Solutions, on building this platform that was totally customised for, for, for what we wanted to deliver. Um, it wasn't all smooth sailing, but it, it you know, it, it really, it functioned very well um, by the time we got to the trial in October. Uh, a really important aspect of this is that we own the IP in that platform, um, so it, it's, it means that we can, we have a platform that we can use either to continue the Ivy Forever project or to use for future SMS projects. And it's also, you know, has the potential to sort of license to, to sort of other organisations who are interested in, in using SMS. Um, so I think just uh, just to visualise some We're of the... Hmm? We're out of time. Oh, now. out of time. Okay. So I just wanted to say, uh, give you an indication of the engagement. We had nearly 100% engagement on this is called the Pregnancy Ladder, which is the sort of story about uh, Ivy worried about being pregnant. Um, these are the sort of responses that we got to, to her question, you know, what if I'm pregnant? Um, uh, business development, I've sort of already covered, covered that, I think, but I, I think internally we've sort of developed a whole range of skills that, including, that include sort of IP and rights management, data protect, protect, protection regulations, which is, um, which is a whole other ball game. Um, a lot of learnings come out for us, out of it for us, especially the sort of contracting and legals with Channel 4 that went on for months and months and months, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. Um, and obviously it raised sort of ethical issues about talking in an intimate way with teenagers and how intimate can you get and, um, and, and trust. And so I think these were um, issues raised for us and sort of the outcomes you know, a really key outcome is that we've developed a relationship with a broadcaster. We're now a preferred supplier. We're not sure if it's going to go to the full six-episode commission, basically because of the sort of turnaround of commissioners at, at Channel 4. But, um, you know, it's been a really fantastic project for us and has, you know, opened a lot of doors in terms of sort of our networks with broadcasters.